northeast coast of Spain, the Mediterranean Sea collects the waters of the river with the greatest volume of water in all the Iberian Peninsula, the River Ebro. Year after year, thousands of tons of alluvial soil are transported by the river down to the estuary. Over the centuries, the sea has gradually lost ground and the original estuary has become a delta. Its privileged location at the halfway point on the migratory routes of European birds and the diversity of its ecosystems have made it a real natural paradise for birds, a magical place halfway between the land and the sea. The delta has been subject to human intervention since ancient times. Canals and irrigation channels were opened. Many natural ecosystems were converted into farmland. Year after year, the area untouched by human activity was reduced and nothing was done to stop it. It was not until 1983 that protective measures were finally taken. By this time, only 25% of this important natural area was still untouched. In order to guarantee its conservation, the Catalan regional government created the Ebro Delta Natural Park. After centuries of decline, this paradise could at last look to the future with hope. Human occupation of the area goes back to prehistoric times. Roman fleets fought it out with the Carthaginians off these coasts in the 3rd century BC. After them, Jews, Muslims and Christians came to live here and left their mark on local culture and traditions. The Muslims were the first to carry out small-scale agriculture. They built water wheels and irrigation channels and created the first permanent settlements in the Delta area. However, rice cultivation only became widespread with the construction of irrigation channels in 1860 and 1912. Since then, it has been the dominant agricultural crop in the Catalan wetlands. Rice, in fact, is still the most important crop for local farmers. In some cases, farming techniques and tools have remained unchanged despite the passing of time. At present, half the land is given over to rice fields and 25% is for fruit trees and vegetables. The only area not given over to farmland is the natural park itself. The generalization of this crop has had important consequences for local ecology. The first and most obvious consequence was the elimination of large tracts of reed beds which were made into farmland. Also, the rice fields have to be irrigated. To this end, there is a network of canals and irrigation channels which covers almost all the delta area. The enormous volume of fresh water that enters the wetlands makes the seawater recede and reduces the salinity level. This affects both the flora and fauna in these waters. For the majority of birds, however, the rice fields are a source of food and a safe place to shelter from the threat of predators. 
70% of the bird species of Spain can be found in the Ebro Delta. The variety of its ecosystems means that you can find typical coastal species, riverbank species, lake birds, and those that prefer terra firma. The most abundant are seabirds, but in the inland wetlands, the dominant birds are definitely the Anatidae or duck family. There are continuous visits to these waters throughout the year. Many flocks arrive from northern Europe, fleeing from the harsh winter. Others have their breeding grounds here, so they do not appear until spring. Lastly, some Anatidae use the Ebro Delta as a simple resting place on their journeys of migration. They arrive from the north around about October and before the year is over, they continue their journey south. The male's plumage stands out because of its vivid colors with which it tries to attract the females. The females, however, do not need to attract anyone, and their priority is to protect their eggs. Their plumage helps them to blend in with the surrounding vegetation. Every year, the lagoons receive the visit of another great migratory bird, the great crested grebe. The vegetation on the riverbanks is essential for the construction of its nests and the river fauna provide them with enough food to enable them to raise their chicks. Shortly after birth, the chicks already accompany their parents when they go fishing and they immerse themselves in the water for the first time. This wealth of fauna would not be possible if the waters were not also full of life. This meeting of river and sea has given rise to a great diversity of habitats. The waters that are nearest to the river are fresh, but as the coast becomes nearer, the salt level rises. This variety is reflected in the fauna. In the delta, it is possible to find typical river species, sea species, and even some that have adapted to both mediums. Of these, there are two very rare species which, in spite of their size, are considered to be zoological treasures because of their uniqueness and their tiny population, namely the Iberian tooth carp and the Spanish tooth carp. The only other European colonies of these fish are in isolated parts of southeast Spain. The shores of the lagoons and shallow waters in general are home to the most important bird group, the wading birds. The different species are distributed across the delta according to the salinity of the water. Some birds, such as the avocets, prefer salt waters, while the solitary sandpipers prefer their waters fresh. Ducks, avocets, black-winged stilts or herons cover the whole park and have made it the second most important aquatic habitat in the western Mediterranean after the French Camargue. The abundance of life in these waters has not gone unnoticed. 
The Anganyisada and Tangada lagoons have been national hunting reserves since 1966. The fish supplies have also been tapped from ancient times and the brotherhoods of fishermen already existed in the 12th century. On the beaches, people catch donax clams, small mollusks that live in the sand and are very popular among the local people. There is a very tight control over this activity. Only Delta residents may catch shellfish, and even so, licenses are limited. Thanks to this control and to the imposition of a closed season, sustainable catching levels have been set, which do not endanger the population levels of this mollusk. Each area has its own specific fishing technique. The hopper, or gangul, is a special type of net which is used for catching eels and crabs. This net is left submerged overnight. The next day, the fisherman goes back to the places where he left his nets, empties the contents into his boat, and then replaces the nets. Drag nets are used for sea fishing. This is perhaps the most modern of all the fishing methods used in the Ebro Delta, and it's also the most effective in terms of numbers of fish caught. All the different types of fish and shellfish are taken to the local fish market where the catch is sold by auction to possible buyers. The inland fields of the delta are fertile thanks to the mud that the Ebro has deposited over the centuries. On the coast, however, the vegetation has to withstand a very high salt level, poor soil that does not hold water, and an almost constant wind. These factors make them unsuitable for cultivation, and this has been their salvation. The immense majority of untouched land in the delta is on the coast. The coastal birds are also the most abundant in the natural park. There are some particularly important colonies. The slender-billed gull, for example, has its second biggest breeding colony in Europe here. The gulls make the most of almost all marine resources. Their diet includes fish, crustaceans, carrion, and even other birds' eggs. However, these small animals that live in the sand on the beaches are the property of another bird, the sandpiper. As the tide goes out, flocks of sandpipers run among the waves in search of food. Their short legs do not let them go too far into the water, but they are very well designed for running, which is an essential ability given their way of feeding.
The sandpipers belong to the same group as the avocets and the black-winged stilts. They are wading birds and, like other species of sandpipers, have chosen the coast as their home. One of them is particularly noteworthy for the peculiar way it feeds itself, the turnstone. As its name suggests, its hunting technique consists of lifting up the pebbles on the shore in order to eat the animals sheltering underneath. The turnstones only visit the Ebro Delta in winter. Their breeding grounds are much farther north in coastal regions near the Arctic Circle. The salt lagoons of the Ebro Delta are visited every year by legendary bird. The ancient Egyptians believed it to be the phoenix, the creature that burned itself to cinders only to arise from the ashes the next day. Its pink pigment, which was like fire, or flamma in Latin, gave rise to a legend and is the root of its name, the flamingo. The flamingo's diet is made up of small crustaceans and mollusks that inhabit the lagoons. In order to be able to capture them, the inside of their beak is endowed with numerous small flaps. When the water comes in, these flaps lie flat so as not to offer any resistance. But when the water is expelled, the flamingo lifts them up. The water filters through them and small animals are trapped inside. While the beak carries out this operation again and again, the flamingo moves its legs to lift up the mud from the bottom of the lagoon and the small crustaceans that make up its diet come with it. All the females lay their eggs at the same time of year, so the chicks of each colony are almost all born at the same time. After four days in the nest, the chicks are gathered in large groups under the care of just a few adults. From this moment on, the parents will only visit their young to feed them. It takes the young some time to acquire what will be their definitive plumage with its characteristic pink shade. Contrary to the rest of the birds, this shade is not permanent. The flamingos get this from the organisms that make up their diet. The birds will inevitably return to their original white color if they do not have the pigments produced by these organisms, as zookeepers well know. The only places in Europe where flamingos breed regularly are in the Camargue in France and the Laguna de Fuente de Piedra in Spain. They are really just passing through the Ebro Delta, a place of rest at the halfway point on their migratory cycles. The majority of the European colonies move to winter quarters in Africa. However, not all follow this example. Every year, a variable number of flamingos spend the winter in the saltwater lagoons of Spain. On some occasions, there are just a few, but in some seasons, there can be several thousand. After spending some months in the saltwater lagoons of the Ebro Delta, most flamingos continue their migration. A 
group of men and women are going to monitor the flamingo population in the breeding grounds of the Fuente de Piedra Lagoon, 600 kilometers south of the Ebro Delta. After a quick look around, they go directly to the nursery. The chicks are still too young to fly, so they have not been able to escape with the rest of the colony. They are soon pushed back against a wire fence. Hundreds of chicks are led to the shore. Using the wire fence, the men lead them out of the water and into a pen specially built for this operation. When all the flamingos have been enclosed, a few people go inside the pen and start taking out individual birds. Fortunately for the flamingos, this rounding up process does not end in death. The only reason for capturing them is to ring them. A record is kept of each individual that is ringed and its main features are noted. It is measured and the place and date of capture is recorded. Thanks to this simple method, the ornithologist can follow its migration all over the world. At the same time as the birds are ringed, blood samples are taken and they are given a general examination. In this way, the vet can detect any illness or complication which may be affecting the colony. After the analysis, the chick is wrapped in a cloth and weighed. The flamingos that have been ringed are returned to the lagoon. At last, it's the last bird's turn. When the last bird has been ringed, the operation comes to an end. The gates of the pen are opened and the rest of the chicks are freed at last. Soon the chicks will be adults and the flamingos will fly south. Perhaps next spring, on their return to their breeding grounds, the flocks will once again stop over in a unique land, a natural paradise in northeast Spain, a place where a river meets its sea.